So Martin, I would say that uh, we're going to have to address the elephant in the room, but people can clearly see there is no elephant in the room. There is no elephant in the room. So... Unless there's a ghost. It is not an elephant, but it is a camera, actually. Hello, people watching this on YouTube. What to do, y'all? We are doing an experiment. Well, actually, the experiment was two weeks ago. Yeah, we, we did that. We did the actual experiment. We did experiment. the, like, actual live stream experiment. But, uh, and for people who are listening to this on the audio feed, you're not going to be able to see this, but people oh, have true. been asking us on the YouTube channel to do a video version of the podcast for a long time, and it was not feasible. For a long time, because my normal camera does not film in, uh, or it can't film for long enough yeah. to stream. Yeah, because of tax reasons or whatever. Y- well, it's, yeah, some weird it's European like t- tariffs, tariffs and stuff, yeah. In Europe, they're like, yo, if you have a video camera that can record for more than 30 minutes, then you got to pay more to import that. So Canon and every other maker really just gets around it by just imposing this 30 minute limit. Yeah. And then my other camera just like overheats in 15 minutes, so that well, doesn't that, work. That would not be a problem. <laughs> Wait, that would not be. That would be. A problem, that would be a problem. Is exactly. No, what it I meant is to a say. problem. That, that was is, the camera I started it's YouTube a problem. on. And I remember I was like, okay, I've got to do this in 15 minutes, otherwise the camera you just, will overheat. You just did it, and w- did it turn off? Yes. Oh, it would turn off all the time. It overheated to the point that it stopped working. Yeah, it, it just shuts off. So and that Anna, is a problem. So Anne is using that camera right now to do some like YouTube stuff of her own that she wants to get started. But she better hit like, that time limit. That's why she doesn't want to do it right now because she's like, I can only film for 15 minutes and I Work can't really get into my artwork. That's dope. It's, that is true. Yeah. Constraints are useful. I remember when I used to put it up on the bookshelf and film from that. But I do also remember very vividly many videos that I'd be filming, the camera would shut off. I'd get really angry and I'd have to leave the room and let it cool down for about half an hour before I could come <laughs> back and finish the script. So I'm very that's, glad. That's focus breaking right there. I'm very glad those days are over. Um, but we've been wanting to do this for a while. So I actually picked up a camera that is built specifically for streaming. We got a lens adapter. So I'm able to use the nice lens that I use for my videos. And we're just going to try to upgrade the show for you guys. And this yep. particular episode is yep. being pre-filmed. Um, but what we're wanting to do come like I don't know, maybe two or three weeks from now, hopefully. It's in the near future. That we're like, future. we're getting used to this first. Yeah. We want to establish a schedule where we're going to live stream the podcast on my main channel. We're going to establish like a specific time every week so you can, you'll can you know when to show up if you want to watch it live. Um, we'll probably have chat. I don't know if we're going to like take questions from the chat, but we'll at least have it. And then we're going to take the recording from the stream. We're going to put it up on the podcast channel and we're going to upload it to the audio feed. So all of you listening to the audio feed, Basically, nothing will change for you other than you can probably tell the audio is different because we're both using one mic right now. So we're going to have to work through a few like little technical hoops to figure out like how to get the audio just as good as it was using two amazing professional podcasting mics like literally in our faces now that we all have that. But I am using the same mic I use for my videos. So hopefully, hopefully we will be pretty much back up to par very quickly. Yeah. But hey, that's the price of evolution. You got to upgrade it is the slowly price. and deal with the mistakes. Yep. So I think that's all we're going to say about that. I guess I should say, um, for those of you who are on the audio feed and you want to check out the video feed, if you just go over to collegeinfogeek.com slash cast or cigpodcast.com, which is our little short link, there's a button right on that page to go subscribe on YouTube. So if you want to check out the video versions of this podcast, that's where it's going to be. Yep. And that's all we got to say. So let's get into the actual topic of this episode. Yes. We are analyzing another book this week, actually. And I forgot to put my phone on Do Not Disturb, so I'm going to do that You now. fool. I am a fool. You yeah. imbecile. <laughs> so uh, this week, we are, we're going to go through the personal MBA. And for those of you on YouTube, you can actually see it here. I'm just going to put it right here, even though it's a little out of focus. It's close Bam. enough. You can still read it. Although it covers up all of our beautiful stickers on our laptops. Yeah. I was noticing that your laptop is very nicely arrayed with stickers, and I have like this big gap that's just kind of missing right now. Yeah, what's up with that? So my laptop sticker strategy, if you can call it that, like that sounds way too pretentious. The next episode is going to be on laptop sticker strategy. That's the next podcast episode. Do not tempt me, Martin. I'm sorry if that becomes the next episode. It was an accident. Okay, legitimately, I do want to talk about that for a second. I had an idea once. They sell these like faux chalkboard decals you can put on your MacBook. So, cool, but I hate chalk. 
Go on. My idea, you can do it with whiteboard as well. Mm. So my idea was cool. like, what if you put that on your laptop? You could have two different little possibilities here. Number one, you could put, a, you could just write there. If I'm procrastinating, give me hell about it. Just okay. like working out at a coffee shop or okay. something. Or you could just write like something interesting or, hey, I'm friendly, strike up a conversation. Just like some sort of cool little networking hack. Because I've That's had people cool. come up and they're like, oh, hey, what's, you have Splatoon stickers on your laptop. Or, hey, you have like, what's this weird um, face on your laptop. It's my brother's rap icon. Yeah. They're like, I don't know what that is. So that's pretty cool. I want to hear about it. Yeah. So I'm like, whoa, what if you had the ability to write stuff? That's pretty cool. Or you could write like, right now I'm supposed to be working on my English paper. If I'm not doing that, like, I'll give you five bucks if you call me out on it or something like that. Yeah, see, what I would I put is, like talk to me in Spanish or French yeah, or something. You, you know, then you got that practice. By the way, That'd be um, cool. the dude cashiering at Whole Foods today, he's like this dude who just looks like you and me uh he just like switched I'm just effortlessly in, our, in my mind well he doesn't doesn't look like a, he doesn't have a beard he doesn't have like half a beard okay but okay he's very clearly like not a native spanish speaker but he just like switched over to spanish immediately to some customer today good and i was like all right so martin's gonna have a good time when he goes to whole foods I next do. and the next time whenever you go last time i went there was for a spanish meetup actually so very fitting. We tried to grocery shop there yesterday, and we couldn't find half the stuff we needed, so I don't know Maybe how. Maybe you need weird stuff. Maybe we do. I don't know. We were looking for, like, shredded cheese, and it was like, they wanted, like, five or six bucks for shredded cheese. So you found it. Well, yeah. So that You just didn't find the cheese. Expensive. That's because Whole Foods or, specifically cuts out certain brands that don't represent their values. So you did find the items. You're just being, you're in the wrong store. We're just, yeah, we're being picky. You fool. Yeah, well, Whole Foods is corporate, man. I, I mean, it, <laughs> yes. But it's still cool. Anyway, um, I don't even know what I was talking about. I don't. With, with laptop, to stickers laptop sticker and, strategy. And some, oh, yeah. my strategy was I wanted to add stickers as I had experiences. like So they're I, all from an event or something. An event effect. or just like something cool that happened. Like my brother's rap thing. He's like, hey, I have this cool icon I made for, um, where is it? Right there. Yeah. Yeah. So like this is his like rap thing. He designed it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'll support that. I'll put that on my stick yeah, on my laptop. Cool. That's awesome. And I've got like College Info Geek right there. I've got these Splatoon stickers that I got because there's an artist that I really love and she came out with them. So I was like, okay, that's kind of an organic thing. But I didn't want to just go out and like willy nilly buy stickers. Which well, I well, okay. I didn't I, don't, I didn't don't mean willy nilly okay. buy stickers. Yeah. I very specifically bought stickers. I apologize for not Acknowledging the intentionality of your sticker purchases. Thank you. <laughs> I accept your apology, and it means a lot to me. I'm glad we can move on to this. Yeah. I respect our friendship. And I respect yeah. Our love. yeah. <laughs> but for me, it was just like I want to kind of like organically collect things due to That's events. Fair. So be minder that they actually sent that to me because I've worked with them on some things. This is a Patreon sticker I got from VidCon. This is a Pokemon sticker that I got from the Pokemon store in Japan. And like, that's a Ravenclaw sticker that Ashley gave me, and I think you gave me the Everone sticker. Oh yeah. I think so it's I all like stuff that's happened in my life, and I haven't filled it up yet. So cool. Anyway, we have Fair. recommended this book, The Personal MBA, for years. I read this book probably back in 2011, and I think that every student, and even if you're listening to this and you're out of college, every young professional should read this book. So what this book is, is it is not like it is not like an actual masters of business administration, like stand in book. You're yeah. not going to see a ton of case studies that are in depth. And like, here's how method differentiated their soap from all the other soap and gained yeah. shelf space on target. Like we actually studied that case study in business. I don't know if you did, but we did. No, not that specific one. But you, you did case studies. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, this is more of just like a really, really good distillation of all the main topics in business. And I think when you understand how business works, how like just you have a broad understanding of like how marketing works, how sales works, how value creation and how value delivery works. So how things are made and how they're delivered to customers and uh, how teams and systems and how your own mind works, you're gonna become a better employee or potential business owner if you wanna be an entrepreneur and this is the thing that I really want to impress on people. When you understand business, no matter what sort of field you're in, you understand the incentives that drive your managers, 
and the owner of the business, and that makes you a more valuable asset to them. Yeah. So I think even if you're like a biology major and you're like, I'm going to go study, you know, dead flies or something. I'm picking dead on my flies. friend Sally because she actually has to like count dead flies as part of her. There are two work. now. <laughs> two now. <laughs> Um, even if you're doing that, like you're going to work for somebody and that somebody has managerial stuff they have to deal with. They have the business they have to run. So if you're just like, I understand that there's going to be things you'll pick up on or opportunities that you will come across that you'll be able to take advantage yeah. of. So, um, the chapters in this book, now this is one of those books that I think you, you could not even finish and you would get a lot out of Yeah. because it's not like everything sort of interconnects. It's more like there's a chapter on value creation. It's like an encyclopedia on cool ideas that relate yes. to business. It is an encyclopedia. Yeah, you exactly. can totally skim through it and look at what you're interested in and still gain something. And I think I've got some old sticky notes in here. Like these are old. So I'm remembering it did when say years. It's been years, yeah. It says right here, blog post on this sticky note. <laughs> so I remember when I picked this book up, I was reading through it and you know, every concept it goes through is like usually one page or less. Maybe yeah. two pages for some of the bigger ones. But I was reading through like every concept. I was like, wow, I could write a blog post on that. Or I could apply that to my internship and I'm going to get a raise or something. Um, so yeah, there's value creation, there's marketing, sales, value delivery, finance, the human mind, working with yourself. So productivity tips, essentially. Those things like Parkinson's law in here, hindsight bias, setting goals, building habits, uh, working with others. So communication, the uh, social proof, social signals, cool stuff like that. And then the last part of the book is understanding systems, analyzing systems, and improving systems. So working with the systems in the company that you eventually uh, join or building systems in your own business. We've been hardcore on that recently. Yeah. Right? I mean, we've been just like... Yeah, we've been trying to step things up a little yeah. bit. The reason we're able to do this video podcast is because I've gotten help and we've started building systems. Yeah. And your girlfriend Ashley is working with me now. Yep. We've got systems in place for having our content manager assign tasks to her, make sure they're done. She can easily ping me through Slack. Um, so we've like we've tested all these things. It's all things. coming together. It is all coming together. Uh, it's turtles all the way down and it it's only going up. <laughs> Shout out to John Greens. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's the title of his new book. Yeah. Like, I, it's, I just love that. So what we're going to do with this book, this gigantic encyclopedic book that is like impossible to really summarize. Oh, no, we'd be here for the next eight hours or much longer, probably. We're going to be here till next Thursday. To tell you everything in the book. Yeah. And honestly, like you should just read. It's it's hard to summarize. Check it out at a library. Flip through it. Look at the lessons you think are cool. I don't know, I don't know if it's impossible to summarize because Derek Sivers did it. Well, Derek Sivers is a god, clearly, because I just said it was impossible. Well, Derek Sivers proved you wrong. Sorry, bro. He got there first. No, honestly, Derek Sivers is pretty awesome, and there is a summary on his site. I think it's like sivers.org slash books, I want to say. Um, and it's one of his top-rated books ever. I think I had bought the book before reading his summary, but he said, this book is so good, I hired Josh Kaufman, the author, as my business coach. Oh, on that's there. Are you that's looking cool. for it? Yeah, I'm looking for it right now. Yeah, just, I mean, just do personal MBA, uh, Sivers. Yeah, uh, so yeah, it's Sivers. Did he give it like a 10 out of, book. Or you get a 9 out of 10. So, oh, he rates Which them. is weird because he, he gave it a 9 out of 10, but then it, the first thing is, wow, a masterpiece. So what's, what's, a, what's a 10 out of 10? Uh, Mind-wise, how we understand what others think, believe, feel, and want by Nicholas Epley. Okay. And um, So Good They Can't Ignore You and The War of Art. And oh, oh yeah. yeah, they're they're oh they're they're ranked so that like the 10 it is in order. Are so there are several top. ten out of ten. Okay, I just found it a little bit interesting that he Fair. gave it nine out of ten, but he's like, this is a masterpiece and it's so good. I hired the dude as my business coach. I mean, he typoed. Uh, maybe yeah. Maybe but he meant ten. Actually, I, so with his summary, I think it's good, but it probably also represents the things that mattered most to him. Yeah. And Derek Sivers is a seasoned business owner who has a company under his belt that he has built from the ground up and sold, which you have used before. I don't know if you know this. Um, I don't recall. CD Baby? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You did your, uh, My music's your on there. music through CD Baby that got you on Spotify, iTunes, all that stuff. I forgot that he did that. He's the guy who built that, and then he sold it, and now he's like this philosopher guy who writes books and does cool things and learns how to code. That's cool. And does answer emails, apparently. So, yeah. But you could look through the, the summary, but I, th I think it's a book worth reading. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to go through three lessons each for a total of six. And I just want to share with you what I thought was really cool in this book. Yep. So the first lesson that I took from this book is uh, the expectation effect, which is on page 136. That was very almost one of mine as well. R was it? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a well, good lesson. I stole it. Just like you stole that showed you screen from our friend. Yep. So have you ever ordered from Zappos.com? I, I have not. You've not ordered from, it's like the Spanish word for shoes. It's almost sort of. the Spanish word for shoes, almost. Mm, zapatos, whatever. I don't like close. ordering clothes or shoes online. And I don't really buy, I don't like buying clothes or shoes in general. So I have oh, no, yeah. no urge to change that. Yeah, buying clothes and shoes sucks. That's why I buy gray converse every time I need shoes. Yeah, I like buy the same <laughs> kind of shoe Unless every, I need every time. Shoes. Yeah. So Zappos knew that like your problem is the problem everyone has. I don't want to buy shoes online because every time I go to the shoe store, the sizes are different for different brands. I don't know how it's going to look. Like my thing with shoes is it always looks really cool on the shelf, but then I put it on my feet and I'm like, yeah, is this going to match the jeans I wear? No idea. Yeah. So they, um, they had great prices. They had like an ironclad return policy. You don't like it, send it back. And they also, I think they had a program where you could actually order a pair of shoes that would send you three sizes and then you just keep the one you oh, want, return the ones you don't like. Yeah. That's and cool. uh, Suit Supply, where I got my suit, they do that as well. Oh, yeah. So, I thought somebody else did that, too. Yep. That's a really good way to do it. Now, I was, like, so anal about my suit. I actually went to New York City, not just for the suit, but I waited for a New York trip so I could go to Suit Supply and actually try it on there. Uh, fair. But the fact that they have that program, it's just, like, it eliminates risk for the yeah. customer. But something they don't advertise is their delivery time. So... At least back when they started doing business, I think like the Amazon Prime thing is sort of standard now, or at least people feel like it is. But back when yeah. the Zappos started, it was like you would expect a week to get your shoes or to get anything. Yeah. And they would basically say that estimated delivery time, five to seven business days or whatever. But then the shoes would show up in two days. Yeah, they give like free expedited shipping, but they yeah. wouldn't they wouldn't tell you about it. They don't tell you about it. And so that's that is the expectation effect because people often judge the quality of something by how far it exceeds their expectations or falls short of them. Yeah. And the book actually creates like a formula out of it. He calls it the expectation effect. So basically like the overall quality or at least perceived quality of something is the performance minus the expectations. Yeah. So I found this to be interesting because like, say you're in an interview trying to get a job or say you're a freelancer and you're trying to pitch a client on your services. You need to set the expectations high enough that they're going to hire you. But if you set them too high, then you're setting a bar for yourself that it's going to be tough to meet. And even if you meet it, you don't dazzle them. Yeah. You just like, they expected that and that's what they got. You've increased the risk of disappointing them at the expense of you can really not surprise them with awesome stuff now unless you try a thousand times harder. Yeah. Actually, you know what I'm thinking about right now? When I hired you to do the redesign you expected to get paid a certain amount. And then like, I think I wasn't trying to like leverage the expectation effect, but like I knew I was paying you not enough for what the work you were doing. So I was just like, I'm going to give you more money. Yeah. And I didn't expect I don't know. that. Like how, what did that make you feel? I, never I was asked dazzled. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> I, a little sarcastic. I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> I actually didn't care. I could have. I, th I think it I like. I would have taken five bucks. For it that impressed job. upon me more the weight of the project. It was just like, yeah. oh yeah, this was a big deal, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And I was, but I was kind of hoping, like, I, I did feel like I should pay you more anyway because I was like, wow. And I mean, it must I, have had I some sort of good effect. We're working is, together right now. Yeah, but I was just like, I want to make sure that like he gets a good feeling out of this job, not like he built this ten thousand dollars worth of web work and only got paid like twenty five hundred. Yeah. So I'm just like, I'm just gonna pay you more. Yeah. Uh, and I actually, I worked with somebody in high school who did that. We agreed on fifty bucks for a job, and it ended up taking me longer and it being way more complicated than she expected. And she just gave me more money. She's yeah. like, you didn't. And I think that does a lot so. to like not let you have a bad taste in your mouth after a deal where you're like, man, I didn't negotiate that very well. But then you're like, oh, I, right. I know. I know you didn't. But actually, mm -hmm. I'm cool. So let me just renegotiate in your favor. Yeah. And looking back on it now, that job, um, I think I've talked about it on the podcast before. It's the one where I had to like wire up the whole dog daycare with yeah. webcams and yeah. fix their QuickBooks. And I, I ended up doing a zillion things that I wasn't hired to do. But when I look back on it, I'm like, I have like this good feeling because she recognized that it was more work than we initially agreed to. And she paid me more. Now, if she hadn't paid me more, 
I wouldn't have felt cheated because I'm the one who quoted no, 50 bucks for the whole job. Expecting. But when I look back on that job, I'd be like, that's a missed opportunity. I feel bad because I didn't, I got like a pittance for my work. So yeah. she exceeded my expectations by going beyond what she had to do by offering to pay me more money, which is really nice. Yeah. So, um, and the same thing, like the guys I just hired to do my video editing, they have been exceeding my expectations. I had seen their work, so I knew what they could do. But then like one time they were like, oh, we just stayed up all night to finish this video tonight. So you can post it today. Oh, see, that actually, when I was reading this section, what it made me think of is something kind of like that, but where imagine, imagine they're gonna do it and they think they can get it done tonight. Imagine mm -hmm. if then they first say, I think we're going to we're going to stay up real late tonight and get this finished today. Now you expect it to be done. You you think yeah. they're doing that. And if they don't, now they've got to come back to you tomorrow and walk back that promise. Yeah, we exactly. decided not to. Yeah. Even though they're not late by the original standards. Mm -hmm. But since they didn't tell you that first, it's impressive that they stayed up that late and did it. So they yeah. didn't they didn't raise expectations in a way that would hurt them later. So I have two questions for you regarding this. Because like when, when people's expectations are violated, they get really mad. Yeah. And actually, before I ask you those questions, I do want to mention something. So I'm reading this book called Debt, The First 5,000 Years. Yeah. And it's like this giant anthropological study of the origins of debt and how it's kind of affected society. It's a really good book. It's really complicated. But um, the Crash Course... World History 2 series on money talks about it. Oh. And like the reason I was interested in this book is because in economics class, you know how you learn like there was barter and then there was money. Yeah. And that's how economy started. Well, when you look at the anthropological evidence, there is no evidence of that. What there is evidence of is there's just debt arrangements before money comes into the picture. Mm -hmm. But then money makes debt like quantifiable and transferable. So it sort of so changes. It, e it eased up how debt worked. Yeah. So like before money, it could be like, oh, well, I handed you my shovel to use for a job. You kind of owe me now, but it's like a personal thing between us. And like, I respect you. I know you pretty well. So like, if you can't pay me back, it's probably fine. It's like, I know someday. But there's not a lot of someday, specifics. Yeah. Someday down the road, you hit me up. Yeah. But if it's like a loan, and I'm like a bank and I can give you that loan and I can transfer that loan to somebody else and like maybe they're a dick, but you still owe them the money because I've sold that debt up to them. Yeah. So it kind of changes things up. Yeah. One of the things I found really interesting in this book though is it talked about how revolts throughout history, like peasant uprising, revolution, all that kind of stuff, much, much, much more often about debt and people wanting like the slates wiped clean than like slave revolts. And the reason for this is like slavery is obviously awful, but the thing about slavery is like, it does set an expectation. Like the person who is a slave has been like degraded and that's horrible, but a lot of times they kind of accept that that's their loss. They expect it, this is what's going to happen. Right, there's that so expectation. You didn't, you didn't make it worse than they already expected. Yeah. Which was basically so, as worse as it can get. It's like the worst but, thing ever, right? I mean, the book yeah. like literally says like, it's like a living death. You yeah. kind of have like all of your freedoms and all of your entanglements and relationships ripped ripped from you. So it is like a living death, but there, the expectation is set that it is that living death. Whereas with debt, to for debt to exist, there has to be like an equality between the two parties. You're making a deal. They're not you're, forcing yeah, you're you making a deal, to do right? it. Yeah. So then the, the deal has happened and like there's this at least illusion of the equality between the two parties. But then like say it's a farmer who took a loan to get his farm started and then, you know, a, a bad season hit. So now due to the terms of the debt, the the person who lent them the money can come and say, all right, well now I own your land and you're a sharecropper. Essentially turning them into a slave, like serfs, almost like slaves. They couldn't really get out of that situation, but they're not slaves. It's just because of the debt. And, so their expectations, yeah. I was equal th with this person and now I'm not. Now yeah, I'm like, hey, like we made a deal. A slave I thought them. you respected me. Exactly. So a lot of times when new regimes take over old regimes or when there's, you know, revolts or anything, their number one demand is like, clear the debt, clear the slates. And a lot of times when new kings would take over kingdoms, that's the first thing they would do. Just hmm. be like, debt amnesty, wipe the books clean, all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's a good way to get popular first thing. Yeah, so what I found is just like, think about expectations all the time because that's what really drives people and that's what like kind of sets their preferences and how they remember you is what were your expectations or their expectations of you and what did you do to yeah. either meet those, exceed them, or not meet them. Yeah. So the first question, how do, I mean, you have all these entrepreneur people who are like, 
you got to set expectations so high for people. You got to promise in the moon and you got to hustle and deliver it. Like what, what's the bar though? Like how do you figure out? I don't know. Like if you're a web developer and I'm like, I need the redesign. How are you going to like pitch that to me without over promising? Yeah, that's actually pretty difficult. It's really tough. And the thing is, if you consistently provide good quality, people are going to get used to whatever quality that was. Yeah. Basically kind of like the hedonistic treadmill, but focused on somebody else. Yeah. And yeah, I guess the thing is, if the trend is that you are performing normal and occasionally do something amazing, the amazing thing is still amazing. But if you do amazing things every time, well, that was gonna it's be my not second amazing question. anymore. It's like, yeah, how do you, how do you avoid the trend upwards? How do you avoid yeah. a, a gradual raising of expectations that becomes unsustainable for you? But the first thing is like, how do you get the job? Or how do you get the freelance gig in the first place? Like where's, where's like the, the sweet spot of like you, you have them sold. So I guess like my initial thoughts here are like, y you know what you can do. So maybe you promise a little bit beyond that. So you know it's a stretch for you. So yeah. it is a challenge, but you know it's still doable. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that when I had my first job, when I went to Flying Hippo, I had applied and I had told them all the things that I could do. But in the months going up to that, I learned to do more. So yeah. I showed them what I could do at the time and then just improved what I could do without really telling them that I improved what I could do. And therefore, so your expectation was your current skill level, and the way and then you delivered is like made my skills higher you before had a that happened. To improve, yeah. Oh, okay, and you, I remember you were going through a bunch of web I read, development. I read books. a whole bunch of web development books. Like, so they suggested to me, hey, here, here are two books that might be good to read. So I read the one big book, and then one was part of a series. I read every book in that series okay. instead, and then just tried to learn a bunch of stuff. I figured out a whole bunch of command line tools and became the Matrix essentially. Oh, and that yeah. was never expected of me. That wasn't even what I was hired for. I was just like, oh, I could also run hundreds of servers. So instead of exceeding expectations in the main discipline, yeah, in the original discipline, you kind of like found ways to add like little extra goodies. Like, oh, look, I just learned command line. Or I well, went and on my own volition read the rest of the books in that series. Yeah. So now I knew things you didn't even yeah. know in that a, you wanted me to know. In a previous thing, in a previous episode, you were talking about how you did a lawn mowing thing. Yeah. But to differentiate yourself, you added extra skills by cleaning up their yard after their dogs before that. Mm -hmm. So that's just, you've created an expectation. The normal expectation is that people mow your lawns. They that's just want to mow your lawns. And you've said, I'm better than these people. I'm doing the extra stuff. And so, that's kind of what I did just by extra surprise. They didn't know I was going to have extra scoop, stuff. Poop. Life pro tip. <laughs> You'll get rich. But the other thing Maybe. is, how, how do you avoid that trend of you're always exceeding expectations, so now people's expectations are raising up all the time? Yeah, I don't know, because to give that some sort of formula, it's going to become some sort of cynical, do amazing now, but then for the next assignment, just kind of slack off a little bit, don't yeah. make it too great. But yeah, that's a tough one. I'd say if you're going to turn stuff in, if you're going to get stuff done early... Maybe you get one thing done really early. You do the overnight video, but mm -hmm. don't do the next video overnight. Don't stay yeah. up. Don't stay up all night doing that necessarily. Maybe you can in another two when it's an important thing. Mm -hmm. Do amazing on the important assignments and exceed okay. expectations there. But on something that's not that big of a deal, don't don't bother. I yeah. guess because they're not going to be that excited if it's not that important of an assignment in the first place. And this is kind of counterintuitive because it almost sounds like we're saying like, don't do your best work every time. Well, but I've like eventually your, put best, your best work. work on the best things because yeah. certain assignments and certain projects are going to have a better return. So do amazing on those. Mm -hmm. But then for just like the daily grind. Yeah. You it's don't always like have to do amazingly. That the like very, very useful advice from IT people, like don't fix your family's computers too much because then you become the wizard and they just expect don't you do to know it. how to fix everything. Yeah. Forever. Don't do that. <laughs> but yeah and so i also i just wanted to highlight the last thing like little things can help surpass expectations like i don't know if somebody invoiced me but they put like a cat picture on there or something like, oh yeah that made me laugh yeah. just like little things like that or um i've had uh people like i've ordered t-shirts and like in the t-shirt bag they also send some stickers or something yeah i've had that happen like, that's kind of like, cool i order art and they send a couple little mini prints of other stuff yeah. for free and i'm like cool that's awesome. That's an, that's a positive thing. Or they like and it doesn't sign cost it much. or they like do something mm -hmm. that you didn't pay help. for. I remember like I used to send newsletters and then in the PS I would just like add something extra like a joke or here, like I found this cool app this week. Here you go. Check that out. Yeah. Just kind of exceed It's not the requirement, 
Mm -hmm. It's just something extra. So what was your first lesson? My first lesson my dude? is about decision. Decision. And okay. What like I being decisive? Just, just decision in general because this part, there's a nice etymological story that he points to that helps like to bugs? define what decisions are. Yeah, entomological story. <laughs> no, etymological story because he points out that the word decision actually comes from Latin for basically to cut off or separate. And so like to cut off the other paths you could have taken. Yeah, this much? is how he's framing it is that you're cutting off all the other options. Okay. Because if you did not cut off all options but one, you did not actually decide on anything. Yeah. So right now I am choosing, I have decided to record this podcast. And because of that, I am not saving a cat stuck in a tree. Or playing Crash Bandicoot. That version of Martin, those, yeah, those versions, I cut them off. They cannot happen because I chose this. And if I sat around like vacillating between the options going, I'm not really sure which one I should do, I've chosen nothing and I've cut off every option. Mm. So he's pointing out the importance of accepting that if you want to do something great, you are probably cutting off several other things that might be equally great. But that's yeah. life. Not even just other all right options, but other fantastic options. You have to cut them off if you want one fantastic option. Or and just push them off into the future. So yeah. it's not like you're cutting them off forever. It's more just like you're- You're just saying this I is what, do that not what someday. my present is. Yeah. My present only gets to do one thing. Right. This is what it is. That makes sense. And to take the etymological story a little further, because this, this isn't in the book, I just like etymology. The ah. side, C-I-D-E, and the word decide is actually the same side in homicide. So if you want, just imagine that you are smothering all your other options with a pillow, and that's why you have your current decisions. There's some parallel universe where that's real. Yeah. There's like a parallel universe where there's actually a zillion versions of you, and then one has to kill all the oh, others. Oh, hey, Martin, they wanted to save a cat from a tree. I've got a present for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a box of live grenades. You are killing your other options. You're killing your other opportunities for your present self so that, that one sense. can live. Mm -hmm. It's like a battle royale of opportunity. I like that. So a couple thoughts there. One, I, I did read research at one point that said people who commit to a decision that they know they can't go back on are usually happier than the ones oh, who yeah. like had this feeling yeah, that they could actually switch too. back. And I can't remember where I read the study, I so I'm not either. sure if we're gonna but have I think I've read us. the same thing, but I don't know yeah. where it is. We'll see if we can find it. So it's like, if you can commit and kind of like actually cut it off like that word says, yeah. then you're gonna be more satisfied because so, you know like, okay, I'm 100% all in on this thing, whatever it may be. I think like a good example is, take figure skating for me. Okay. I was doing that as just fun. And then my coach was like, you need to sign up for a competition. And like, once I did that, I was like, okay, now I'm all in. I've signed up, I've paid the fee, and I know I need to get in and do my sessions at least twice a week with my coach so I nail the skills that I need to pass my test. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so from that point onward, it was more like that decision to wake up and go to practice in the morning was less of a decision and more of just like, I'm doing that. That's what I do. Yeah, and I think this, this um what you're talking about, they also referenced that it works best with decisions you can't take back. So imagine that I'm trying to buy a laptop and my choice was either this when I bought it like four years ago or some sort of cool Windows laptop. Yeah. And I'm not allowed to return them. Let's, I hate returning things, so that's basically true for me because it's really stressful. Yeah, so it sucks. So let's imagine that once I bought this, any question about the decision went away because I was like, well, this is what I have and I love it now because it would be very stressful and annoying to change that. That is true. So I love it. It doesn't matter if maybe the Windows laptop has more video games or it has something else that I didn't want. What matters is that I'm now happy with this because I have it. It's because it's what I'm stuck with. Yeah, I've and you know what? Maybe that's what makes online shopping so stressful. Yeah, there are so many options. Like you just, You're just like, is this the best exact thing in the world yeah. on all of Amazon? If it's not the best, I deserve better. This only has 4.67 stars. 4.67? And I can see all these you five peasant. stars, but there's one person here who couldn't figure out what the on switch yeah, is they on. said it broke. But I didn't like it. They're clearly dumb, but I, I might, mm, I'm rethinking yeah, this. If you, if, whereas you, you go to the like Target and you're just like, there's one option. Hey, look, that, yeah. well, I guess that works and you just buy it. You just leave because looking at the reviews yep. makes it stressful. You've Actually, got options you didn't need. I was like, at one point I wanted to buy a new TV. And so I'm just like, okay, pixel counts, refresh rate, all this stuff. I don't know. Should I get the Samsung? Should I get the Sanyo or whatever? The LG over there? Yeah. And then I was like, you know what? This is dumb. And I went to yeah. Walmart and I mm -hmm. bought like the cheap Vizio one and it's sitting out there. And, and you know what I haven't done since? I haven't been like, you didn't return really it for one with better. I would have gone for the Samsung. Nope. 
Yeah. I haven't cared. It it's just, there. It works. It works. It's and fun. I, I enjoy watching TV. I don't enjoy the fact that the the is it bezel or bevel? I don't even know. I think it's bezel. I don't I don't care that the bezel is like a little bit bigger than maybe another TV would be. So yeah. And the thing about done. online shopping is to bring it back to the decision. It's giving you more options to cut off, and cutting off a yeah. decision feels bad because we're like, what am I missing out on? Mm-hmm. And the more options you give yourself to pick between, the more you you have to ruthlessly cull them. You yeah. have to because you can only do one at a time. The other thing is I, I've always found it useful to find ways to make your decisions binding. So if I am – like let's take an example from everyday life. I go to Whole Foods every day or wherever I go, and I'm like, all right, it's time to write. But I've got my browser open. I've got like a couple projects I'm working on. I've got Evernote open with some planning. I don't commit to that decision, but when I open Cold Turkey Writer and I hit go, there's nothing else I can do. Yeah, you're now writing. So I write. So I think it's a good idea to figure out like how can I make myself actually commit to my decision once I've made it. Yeah. So and it's kind of similar to focusing satisfying. because focusing is blocking out every other thing other mm-hmm. than what you want. Yeah. And the more things that there are to block out, the harder it is. So if you can make your decisions easier by minimizing the choices you have, and so you can picking between two options is easier than picking between ten. Yeah. What's that called? Hicks law. I don't know. There's something called is Hicks. There a law? Yeah, it's called Hicks law, and it's like the the more options there are, the longer people decide. Yeah. They take to decide. So they often use this with like website design. Like if you've got a zillion links, then people don't. Yeah. Know it confu- where to it go. can like confuses Use, people, and they're like, should I look leave. at this first or this first? Mm-hmm. How about cute dogs? Or a um, really good dis- really good example of Hicks Law here is there was some supermarket that was selling like 18 different kinds of fish. And they had oh, like 20 this. different fish rubs and their sales were crap. And a consultant comes in and he's like, all right, you're going to sell halibut, tuna, and salmon. And there's three rubs. One rub goes with the halibut only, comes with it. Vice- and the same, yeah. same story for the no other choices. fish. No choices. So it's just like you come in, it's just like, what do you want? Halibut, fish, or salmon? or tuna or salmon, and people were like, uh, I don't know, just that one, I guess. And when they cut it down to three, sales just went through the roof. Yeah, because people didn't stand there and go, uh, but this rub, would it work well on this fish? Well, I'm mm-hmm. not actually educated on fish and the seasonings they require. Yeah. So why am I making this decision instead of a chef? That's, yeah, that's the big thing. Like, we often feel like it's going to be better if we give people more choice, but people... They might know say they want more choice, but what they really want is just to enjoy whatever it is they're going yeah. for. And the three choices and an is expert, enough. Yeah, if an expert's like, this rub works with this fish, you're like, all right, I choose, I yeah. trust you. You've got freedom you've of choice. You've been doing this for a long time. But you've also got freedom from choice. Yes. And we need a nice balance of both or it gets real stressful. Exactly. So uh, with decisions and cutting off, I want to go to my next lesson here because there's a related point. So the book talks about the four methods of completion. Um, this isn't in the working with yourself chapter. So this is essentially like a productivity chapter so in the book. Finishing like a project any, or any a task, task or something? Literally anything, yeah. Okay. So the four methods are completion, uh, deletion, delegation, and deferment. Essentially, you can complete your task, get it done, delegate it, or no, delete it. So d- with deletion, um, that reminds me of like 80-20 rule. Where, Are you just saying, I'm not going to do that? Yeah, like 80% of the results usually come from 20% of the effort. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you can always cut out the other 80% totally, but there's probably something you could cut out that really isn't getting you many results and it's just kind of like taking yeah. up your time. So, for example, we used to do article narrations on the podcast where like Ransom would write an article, I would spend half an hour trying to narrate it, and then I'd send it to you, you have to edit it, and then we get it in the feed. Yeah. And like... Recently, I was like, man, Ransom's got a new article up. I want to get that on the feed because like, you know, 15,000 people will read it or listen to it. And then I was like, you know what? If I do that, I will get fewer videos done. Yeah. And the videos are what causes the results. And I guarantee you like 99% of the audience, if asked more videos or article narrations, they'd pick They videos. would pick more videos. Yeah. So I cut it. Um, and so remember when we read Deep Work, he talked about yeah. the any benefit approach. Yes. Where like anytime you're evaluating a new social media tool or a productivity tool or doing something in your business or uh, this is a good one for students. When you're looking at classes and you're like, maybe I should take that extra class on Linux administration or interpretive dance just because Linux I think it would cool. look. I mean, Linux is cool. It sure is. But take it. All right. I guess this is now a Linux hype podcast no. <laughs> <laughs> but i remember when no. I, when i was doing my like p 
picking my classes for each semester, I'd often see stuff on the catalog and be like, whoa, that would look good on my resume. What if I could also do Linux administration? Or what if I also had technical writing experience? Yeah. But the any benefit approach isn't useful because you never focus in on the one thing that is like the 20% input, 80% output thing. Yeah. Because now you're piling all this stuff Because on. it's like, does this do any good? And it doesn't yeah. ask, is that good enough for the cost? Exactly, yeah. Or I, don't I can know, go to Home Depot something. and I can be like, there's a zillion tools here. Well, literally every single one of these tools has a benefit. They do something. But, but like, is it worth it right now? Do I need a jigsaw, a circular saw, a handsaw, and a table saw? Each one is better than the others for certain types of jobs. But what do I do? Is it worth it for me to part with my money? Yeah. Especially if, like, say that's my job. Say, like, I'm like Nick Offerman. I'm a woodworker in my spare time, and I'm making stuff for people. Do I need all those tools? Or can I keep more of the money from my clients by using one tool that gets the job done? The best. So that's deletion. Uh, there's there's delegation. And every time I think about delegation, I just think of Let It Go from Frozen now. Yeah? <laughs> yep. Let it go. Uh, because... Uh, let's not sing that song. Right you don't want to sing the emo, edgy nope. song from Frozen? Let the storm rage on. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been the hardest one for me historically. I have been like the DIY person to a co- to my core for the longest that time. That is very true. Coded my own website, write all my own articles, figure out how to film all these videos, set up this entire, literally all of it. And I was always convinced that if I let somebody else do it, it would go down in quality or people would think I'm a fraud or something. So I've always had a trouble with delegation until now. I'm like, I'm, I'm starting to hit my stride with it. Yeah. I think we started with you. The building, doors have been opened. You built the first or the fourth version of College Info Geek website. Now you're editing podcasts. And I've got Kayla helping with content stuff. I've got Ransom helping me write articles. And now I've got my video editors. That was the big one. Yeah. Because video editing, I was like, man, video editing. I have all this creative stuff I put into my videos and people love it. And if I like get help, people are going to hate it. But my friend Charlie, who runs a channel called Charisma on Command, which is definitely yeah. something good to check out. When I was hanging out with him at VidCon, he said something interesting. He said, you have to figure out what is your art and what is your ego. So for him, he's really good at pulling lessons out of like, the com- comedy routines of Louis C.K. or, you know, figuring out like, wh- this is why Tyrion Lannister survives in Game of Thrones. Like here are his social skills that work so well. Like that's his skill. He can pull those things out through observing stuff like that and tie it to things that are, people are really interested in. What his, not his art is editing or finding pictures for the videos or any of that stuff. So yeah. he realized if I do that, it's just because I'm stoking my own ego and yeah. being like, I'm like, the only person who can do this. That's really, not his highest value. Right. That's not his art. You know, LeBron James could probably mow his lawn faster than like a neighborhood kid. But that's not his art. His art is, you know, sick dunks, bro. Yep. So he should pay somebody to mow his lawn. So that like that specific phrasing, and I really believe in phrasing sometimes. Um, What is your art and what is your ego? Really put things in perspective. And I was yeah. like, okay, it's time to just figure out what's my art. My art is I'm good at research, I'm good at writing, and I can host videos pretty well. People come to the channel for the host. So I have to do that. But I don't have to edit every video. Because, you know, I still help with the videos. Like we're still filming B-roll and I'm providing things, but like the clicking, the actual keyframing things, like my friends are really good at that. So I let them do that. And you provide more value now. So it's not like people are gonna be like, hey, Get back to editing. What, yeah. are you, what are you doing? Exactly. I want fewer videos. Yes, they want more videos. And th- that is the biggest thing. People are just like, I wish you would publish more often. And the only way I can do that is to let it go. Sorry. I'm sorry. Or not sleep. You I'm could sorry. never sleep. Or I could not sleep. Um, but uh, as we've talked about many times on this show, sleep is important, dude. Don't and do then, it. so this, one, this is the one that kind of ties back into decision. Uh, the last one is deferment. Now, okay. most people listening to this podcast are probably pretty good at deferring things, but oh, not yes. for the right reasons. Yes. Um, but when you strategically defer things, like I want to write a second book and my agent always emails me and she's like, I really want you to write your second book. When do you want to get a proposal done? I really want to do it. And there's a ton of benefits to doing it, but we want to get more videos on the channel and we have to build the systems to do that. So 
you strategically decide to defer that because I can't do it. Deleting it isn't my value. I want to have that no. book come out someday. I can't delegate it. I'm not going to have a ghostwriter write my book, so I must defer it. And that's fine. Yeah. We've done the same things with like our content audit. We're going to go through the website and figure out like what posts need to be deleted, what needs to be updated, all that kind of stuff. But right now, it's not priority. Yeah, it doesn't provide the most benefit in the present. Mm -hmm. And that's the decision we have to choose is yeah. the best for stuff for the present. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you were a student and you're like, oh, wow, there's this cool club I want to join or, you know, there's like a, a game that I want to start coding or a language I want to learn, but you have something else that's a priority right now, then defer it. It doesn't mean that you're cutting that off for the rest of your life. You're just strategically deciding I'm going to focus on this right now and these things later down the line. Yeah. And in a school sense, I put off a lot of projects until the summer, specifically for that reason. That's true. Yeah. Summer is a good time for projects. So before you get into your next lesson, I think we should uh, talk about our sponsor in this episode. Oh, yeah. We, we have do a that. sponsor. We could do that. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about our sponsor. Yeah. So this week's episode is sponsored by FreshBooks. And uh, FreshBooks, we've been talking about for the past few weeks here. If you are a freelancer, if you're a business person, if you do any sort of work on your own, they are your friends because FreshBooks makes tools to help you with your accounting, with invoicing, and with getting paid by your clients. And I mean, both of us have been freelancers. And getting paid is nice. It's Yeah, getting paid is nice, but also not having to deal with all that admin stuff is also really nice. And that's why FreshBooks is awesome. Um, just today, actually, Ransom sent me a FreshBooks invoice, and I was able to pay him online. And that was so nice. So... FreshBooks is awesome because number one, you get this dashboard you can log into. You can see exactly how much profit your business has made this year. You can see how much money is still supposed to come in and who owes it to you. Um, and also when you are like out and about or doing you know business transactions, buying stuff for your business, you can easily pull out your phone, take a picture of the receipt and easily log that expense, which is very important to do yeah. because when you log your expenses, you lower your tax bill. Yes. And that's good to do. I've saved quite a bit. From business expenses, I do not so much. do not underestimate the value of that. Mm -hmm. You do. I saved like hundreds one time. It's well, when it. I uh, when I go to business conferences, like I just went to VidCon last week, and just uh, my receipt stack would have been that big. Yeah, and do you really want to be like uh, this part of the receipt? Yeah, yeah, this one item is a thing. Okay, I'm gonna put that in a box. And tax time, I'm just gonna I'm gonna look through all these and type it's them numbers terrible. in. I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna well, cry. Well, the thing I like to do is I like to every single month have like a little routine where it's like I'm gonna go through all the expenses from that month. But because they're just all lined up, boom, easy to do. Yeah. Uh, and that's what you can do with FreshBooks. The other thing, the big thing with FreshBooks is you get paid faster because you can create professional, awesome-looking invoices in 30 seconds. Send them off to your clients, and this is the nice thing: you see when they've opened them. And I mean, you and I have dealt with this Yeah. many times. You send like something to the client via email or in the mail. I've had a client where I'll send him the email and then I'll have to like follow up three times and you're then just, text You're him. waiting impatiently. And he's like, oh, I, I forgot to check my email yeah. for three weeks. I didn't <laughs> see your invoice. So it does tell you when the client has opened the invoice and they're probably going to pay you faster anyway because you can let them pay online. And that's oh, it's yeah. just incredibly helpful to be able to do that. I love being able to pay Kayla online just instantly. It's done. I don't even know where my checkbook is. I would be really annoyed to have to use it to pay somebody. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is interesting for somebody like you who's done freelance web dev. You can easily split an invoice, one invoice into two payments, an upfront one and then at the end one. So like when you're a web designer, that's usually how people work. That's built into FreshBooks. Front, it's built in. So that's, so, that's actually a really cool way to price things to make sure yeah. you don't get like messed up. You so should, that's I mean, you cool. Should, if you're a freelance web dev or a, if you're doing any kind of work that requires like a big investment of time, you should ask for at least half up front. That's just the yeah. standard way to do it and make sure you get paid. And a lot of times when you're freelancing, I won't say a lot of times, but like every freelancer has the horror story where they didn't get paid. So that kind of mitigates against Even that. full businesses have that story. Yeah. There's a, what do they call that? It's like the write-off something or something. I don't know. There's like a, there's every business, like big businesses, they like, have like they, it's in like the their budget. expected loss. Yeah, there's an expected loss in the budget. Them. Now, when you're a freelancer, you kind of live and die by each client, so you probably don't have an you expected don't want loss one. thing. <laughs> but the easier you make it for them to pay, and knowing when they've opened that invoice, it makes it more likely you're going to get paid. In fact, up to four days faster with FreshBooks. So if you do any kind of work on your own, if you listen to our freelance episode and that inspired you, you can go over to freshbooks.com slash CIG to get a free unrestricted 30-day trial. And uh, when you do that, you can put College Info Geek in the How Did You Hear About Us section. And that lets them know you came from this show that supports us, helps us keep the lights on. And uh, 
Thank you if you do Thank that. Thank you very much. Also, thanks to FreshBooks for sponsoring the show. I'm really excited that we're able to like upgrade things because we work with sponsors. Yeah. So, anyway, on to your, f what? This is the fourth lesson in total, but your second, right? My lesson number two is uh, the section on friction I thought was really useful. Like, uh, like in physics? Yeah, it was all about physics. Oh. Well, actually, the story he gives is very, <laughs> very related to that. Wait, really? But so friction being the extra effort in between you and your goals, things you have to do to get there. So oh, yeah, his, yeah. his actually, it's a really cool example, is imagine you're trying to hit a hockey puck into a goal. It's one mile away. Okay. Okay. You can do that. That's reasonable. Now imagine you're doing it in a field of grass. This grass is a ton of friction. Yeah. Obviously, it's going to take you years to get to that mile goal. Mm -hmm. Now... You can get rid of some friction. You can mow the lawn. Now it's a little easier. You've gotten rid of some friction. Now the object is easier. Or you could pour a whole bunch of water on it, ignore whether it soaks into the ground, freeze it. Now you got an ice rink. It's going to take three seconds. The yeah. power of getting rid of these things is important. So in real life, this means you need to reduce any extra effort between you and your goals. And I think we've talked about this before. There's this thing called the 20-second rule. So if you're trying mm, to build a yeah. habit, let's say, I think a classic example is you want to play your guitar more often. That's what I'm doing right now. Now, if your guitar is locked up in its case, it's in a closet somewhere, Yeah. and you're sitting in the living room, you're just playing some games, and you're like, yeah, I'd love to play my guitar right now, yeah, but it's all the way in there, and the game controller is already in my hand. I'm just going to keep playing ARMS, and then you're not going to play the guitar. By contrast, get rid of that friction. The friction is you walk into your closet, pulling the guitar out, opening it, closing the case, putting it back wherever. So mm -hmm. instead, put it just on a stand within like within a few steps or within reach of where you normally hang out, where yeah. you're likely to want to. Now, you're just gonna pick it up and play it by instinct, just when you have a few seconds. And personally, my piano is set up right now at standing height, right in my living room. And basically, so walk in. every single time I pass it, I cannot help but at least play like 30, 40 seconds of something. And mm -hmm. I'm slowly getting better by accident. I'm not yeah. sitting down. I didn't schedule piano practice. It's just within 20 seconds. I did notice that you were playing some arpeggios again and stuff the other yeah. day. Up there. Yeah, and by, by contrast, if you increase the friction between you and something, you can reduce bad habits. So that's a fun benefit. Yeah. There's a Chrome extension called Crackbook where it's like, you can go to Facebook if you want, if you've picked that as one of the sites that's blocked. It's just that it'll show a black screen with like a 30 second countdown. Yep. <laughs> and if you're not patient enough, as many people won't be, you'll just say, wait, what am I doing? And you'll just close it and then you'll stop. So that's cool. So internet pro tip. Yeah. Go back to dial up. Yeah. Go back to <laughs> dial up because then you're not going to get on YouTube because you're going to be like, this is going to take so long. Why? Oh, yep. or, or if you get on YouTube or Netflix all the time, go, go work in a coffee shop with bad Wi-Fi. I do that. Now you cannot do those things. It's going to take so long. You're just going to be yeah. like, I might as well just work and watch it at home. I actually know specifically which coffee shops have crappy Wi-Fi and which ones have good ones. So if I need to write, I'll go to the crappy one. Yeah. Like the whole thing has bad Wi-Fi. So sometimes I just go there to write because I'm just like, I can't do anything else. Yeah. So in your mind, you're <laughs> like, yeah, it's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. It's inconvenient. It's not impossible, but it's inconvenient to do distracting things. And you probably won't because humans don't like trying very hard. Yeah, exactly. Uh, your example with a guitar very applicable to me right now. Yeah, because, because you've been working on that. That that guitar, my electric one, that has been in the case, and I did, oh, I stopped yeah. playing it's guitar. Way in the corner behind stands and stuff. Well, so the other thing is, I didn't play that for six years because in my um, what was it sophomore year of college, somebody stole my effects pedal and my amp. Oh yeah. So I'm like left with just a, a plinky electric guitar that can make no sounds. Now I know that I can buy an iRig on Amazon. For like 40 bucks and do guitar into my headphones or I could buy a new practice amp very easily I could drive down to Guitar Center or even Walmart but that's friction so and having like, the electric only guitar was friction for you because yes. you lost your equipment so what I did a few weeks ago is I drove to Guitar Center I bought a brand new acoustic guitar and I put it in a stand in the living room and every single day since then I've been playing and if people follow me on Instagram follow me on Instagram I'm not Tom Frankly over there uh, I've been posting guitar videos like all the time and I'm surprised how fast the skills come back. Yeah. Like far surpassed where I was, even though I took a break for six years. And it's because number one, obviously spacing effect that long means that bringing the learning back accelerates it. But like you said, there's no friction. It sits yeah. in the living room. It's right there. Now the one like kind of sad thing about living here in Colorado is the dry air actually dries out your instruments. <laughs> so 
I have yeah, to I keep still it. need to do something about that. Yeah, I had to buy like this guitar humidifier and then like a humidity um, monitor thing. So the guitar is actually in the case right now, and I've noticed that. Write that down right they now. They said like the humidity thing says like you should have to refill it every five days. So I filled it the first day, and the second day I came back and it was already like seeming a little empty. So I'm like, okay, even the few weeks I've had that guitar sitting out, it's probably dried out a bit much. So there is going to be some friction living here in Colorado, having to give my guitar like spa days in the case. Some Just take it to that. the spa. I could do that. Just dump it in the pool. Yeah. That'll get it to soak up some water. Yes. But no. when I can keep it out, and right now I'm enjoying guitar so much that I, I still take it out of the case and play it. But it's definitely the yeah. case that when it's like on the stand, I'll just pick it up and play it. And I yeah. played for like an hour last yeah, night. Yeah, and you don't have to force yourself. Yep. You didn't have you to have it. a to-do. You didn't put anything in a reminder to do it. It's just, mm -hmm. it's right there, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. So insight, it's in mind. Exactly. It's right yeah. in there. And I'm always, actually, um, for a long time in Asana, I had a recurring task once a month to sit there and just reflect on the work we've done over the past month and ask myself, what could we improve? What processes had friction in them? Yeah. Did the designer not know what she was supposed to do? Can I go like write a standard operating procedure document with pictures so she can look, log in and not have to ask me questions? Or is there like, here's a good one in YouTube, you can set upload defaults. So for a long time, I was actually manually typing all the tags. I was manually setting a bunch of like, you know, video location, recording day, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And then I realized like, you can make a default for that. So most of the time, these answers are the same. Yeah. So, so why are you typing them bam. every time? Now I just upload the video and I have to fill out a few things, but not everything. So simplifying, automating, getting rid of things, all good ways of getting rid of friction. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I'll note before we move on is um, friction is something that can be very easely introduced into to, like to-do systems, which can make you stop using them. Yes. So like if it's hard to get a task into your to-do to -do list app because maybe the app takes too long to launch or something, or you're like setting priority levels for it or something like that, that's friction yeah, that you don't need. If you're being too specific about, let me fill out every single box that this to-do thing can have. Yeah. You, you probably don't need all of them. You don't need that. So just like simplify to where it works, but to where there's a minimal amount of friction and you will use yeah. it more often. Cool, so my last lesson here is uh, force multipliers. And this this kind of, I think this ties into friction a bit. So basically he talks about like a force multiplier is any tool or system or really anything that takes the same amount of input and creates more output. Okay. Now, so an example would be um, the YouTube algorithm. Now versus when I started. Because now I probably put the same amount of time or a similar amount of time into a video than I used to. But because I've got all the subscribers, the YouTube algorithm pushes it out to many, many, many thousands more people. When I started, it was like eight people and my mom or something. Yeah, so same effort worth much more. Exactly, same effort. Now the algorithm, I've been building that up to the point where it's like, okay, now this is gonna be pushed out to 100,000 people. And you know, we make more money off of that, we change more lives off of that, but it's, there's no extra effort. You know, and a really simple example, I could try to screw a screw in with my fingers or even use a screwdriver to make it work. A power drill means like almost no effort input, but so much but you more get the same, output. You get the same output. Yeah. So you can either reduce, reduce the input you need to get the same effect or get much more effect. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or like building a studio like this. this the fact that this studio is set up all the time is kind of a force multiplier because now there's less of an input to make a video. I don't have to set anything up. Yeah. So that's also an example of reducing friction. Now, what I wanted to highlight here is something that's really relevant to college students. Um, Cause I remember I, I had some friends in college who were in different majors than ours and they had to work objectively harder to get their things done. But then it was harder for them to find a job afterwards. And they started to have like these feelings like this isn't fair why do I work so hard, but it's harder for me to get a job or I can only get a job that pays this much. Economic forces and the economic value of the work you choose to do can be a force multiplier. Now that applies to the major you choose. Obviously choosing to work in like hospitality is not gonna pay as much as computer science. And I don't wanna say like you have to go straight for computer science because oh, it pays no. more, but you just have to realize that 
the basically the value in the economy of the skill you're learning is in itself a force multiplier for the amount you're going to get paid and for what you're going to get out for the work you put in. Yeah, same amount of hours might do something completely yeah. different. So essentially hard work doesn't always equal more value. It's hard work times the force multiplier yeah. you and get. It, it's easy to think that just, well, you just need to work hard and the universe will go, do you a good turn. But that's mm -hmm. not always the case. You can work really hard, but due to maybe bad force multipliers, what yeah. your work is not worth as much as the next person mm -hmm. doing the same or less work with a better force multiplier. Yeah. The universe isn't fair, so you should figure out how to work within the system. Exactly. So and another good force multiplier. Maybe you spend a little bit of time like researching a company before you go into the interview or you apply. Just like a little bit of time. That like instantly improves your standing because you're able to impress a recruiter or the interviewing, the person who's interviewing yeah. the hiring manager, they are like, oh man, this person's done their homework. So you're like, it's a force multiplier for their perception of you. Yeah, their perception you of you is like a big deal. Even though you spent like 20 minutes just Googling them or something. Or you build yourself a website that looks cooler than what everyone else makes. So it's like perception force multipliers. Um, also like market research is a huge, huge force multiplier because you can put a ton of work into building something, just like put your blood, sweat, and tears into it, and you put it out into the world. If people don't want it, then yeah. why did you do all the so, work so for So your hard work still wasn't worth much. Yeah. So, you know, we haven't made a course yet, but one thing that I did before um, we even started was I sent out a survey to our list, and I was like, what kind of course would you guys want? Like, what's the most important thing? Do you want like a study skills course, or do you want like a career skills course? People were like, answer X. I don't know if we should say what it is because someone else is going to steal our idea. That's fine. It was study yeah. skills. Yeah. People want study skills. so Not that hard to guess. Yeah, it's, it's kind of obvious in, in retrospect. But actually, when you're in my position, it can go either way. Before you get the answers, you can, you can justify either answer. So in my head, I was like, well, all these people are already in college. They might know how to do that. Maybe they're like looking out of the real world as something that just looks look big and scary and they want something like that. But no, they're trying to solve the now problems. Yeah. So do this stuff like that. Use better tools and automations. Um, the other thing I was going to mention here, this might be a little controversial, but uh oh, debt is a force multiplier. Like if you, mm -hmm. I mean, like you said yourself, you couldn't have gone to college if not for your Oh, no, I absolutely, loans. I appreciate and am grateful for my student loans because yes, uh, I have to pay back student loans. That's no fun. It's not fun, yeah. to be fair, but I am paying the interest on those loans mm -hmm. for a product. And that product was a pretty good life right now. Yeah. And good product. I would buy it again every time. So yeah, the one thing I want to mention here is a lot of people are just like, debt is evil, debt's the enemy. And it is true that we have a huge student debt problem, at least here in the U.S. And That's we've true. got people who exploit that. We've got all these companies out there trying to get you to take more debt than you need or go to a school that seems like it's going to be better, but it actually doesn't do much else for you. Yeah. Like, oh, you should go to this private school. You're going to get such better jobs and we have such better connections. And it's like, hmm, is that really the case? Or are you just charging four times more for tuition and now I'm going to be in huge amounts of debt? But the concept of debt itself is not evil. Because like if I'm sitting here and I got a bunch of money and you're like, I don't know, you can break open rocks with a tiny hammer and sell them for like $1 a day. And I'm like, yo, I'll loan you the money to go buy a jackhammer. Yeah. And if I can make it back, that was a smart yeah. decision. If like tomorrow you can start making $100 because you have this tool now, you can easily pay me back in a short amount of time. And now you've got that tool forever. Yeah. So... So using debt. using debt as a force multiplier is good if, yeah. you, if you're being strategic. And the way he, he phrases it in the book is use debt only to gain access to force multipliers. Ooh, Don't only. use debt to buy like stupid things. Don't use your credit card to buy like a helicopter because you just want one. Unless you're yeah. going to be a helicopter pilot and that's an investment. Yeah. So that's kind of so, how I view debt. So what I did was good because education, my yeah. degree is a force multiplier. Mm -hmm. And if you want to think about it with like private schools, just like, okay, this school that's probably four times my effort. Okay. But this private school, it's 4.2 times my effort. Not worth enough. Yeah. Not, worth not a big enough charge. difference. Exactly. Yeah. So that's four multipliers. And that brings us to your last one, right? Oh, yes. Number three. And this is going to sound real basic at first, but I like what he talked about. 
and it's the checklist. The simple, humble checklist. The humble checklist. The humble checklist. Okay. I did not choose this because checklists are mind blowing. I was gonna say we've talked about. I think checklists. we all know about checklists, but his example of the story he tells is really useful and actually even helped me a little <clears> bit. So okay. the story he tells is that they had a hospital. They had a hospital in Detroit, apparently, okay. where they had the highest rate of 10-day IV line infections, which is uh, costly and life-threatening, apparently. I'm not that educated in this topic, to be fair. But it was the highest rate in the country. So he wanted to see this, uh, the guy who did it wanted to see, will checklists make this better? And so the checklist was just wash your hands with soap, clean the patient's skin with some fancy stuff, put mm -hmm. sterile drapes over them, wear a sterile hat and such and clothing and stuff, put a sterile dressing over the catheter, done. None of those are complicated. And a lot of the doctors resisted it because yeah. it also said, hey, the nurse is allowed to stop you if you're not following this list. Uh, and I the do doctors were like, this. this is dumb. I'm a doctor. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And to be fair, yes. But over two years, their rate dropped from 11% of infections to zero. So those doctors who knew what they were doing, yes, they do. They're educated, but people make mistakes in a busy, stressful environment like mm -hmm. that. So if, if you're thinking, I don't want a productivity system. I don't need a to-do list for my morning routine. I know what it is. I'm not dumb. Well, no, you're not, but people forget. Yeah. People get stressed. And all the effort you're putting into thinking, okay, wait, what do I do after this? That is a waste of your effort yep. that takes energy that you could have used to do the thing. Mm -hmm. So this is also good because another one of his lessons talks about externalization being good for our thoughts. Because like putting it into an external system yeah. instead of trying well, to Well, externalization remember. even just in terms of just what we think. So let's say I'm doing a bunch of push-ups. I might get tired and think, yeah, if I did three more, that'd be better, but I'm so tired. Whereas oh, a coach telling okay, the same yeah. thing to us, the coach literally saying the words in my head already, mm -hmm. I'm more likely to listen yeah. because I can go ahead and be like, but do I really need three? I'm not sure if I need three. Where the coach or a to-do list just says, this is the facts. Yeah. You follow it now. You don't get to think about it. It's this. So okay. if there's something you're doing over and over, a checklist, even if you're smart enough to do it without a checklist, may actually still help you. It takes weight off your mind. And as a benefit, it makes it easier to visually see what am I doing and where are the steps that are friction? Where are the steps that I can mm. automate? So process Wait, improvements. Wait, you know what this checklist is? This to-do right here? That's dumb. I shouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Let me fix it and make this a better system. So the to-do list not only can help give you better results and keep weight off your mind, but you can learn to improve your systems through it. And it's yeah. such a simple thing that it's easy to overlook and say, why? Yeah, I know what a checklist is. But incredibly trained doctors went from 11% of a like life-threatening infection to zero because yeah. they just followed a very obvious five-step checklist. Well, I can believe it. I mean, I've been uploading YouTube videos for three years now almost. Yeah, and you got like your pre-flight checklists, uh, right? Well, so I just installed a couple weeks ago, or maybe more than a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago. Uh, it's a plugin called TubeBuddy. And you too, buddy. YouTube, buddy. Yeah, no, Tube Buddy. Oh, okay. And this, it, it adds a lot of things to YouTube, but one of the things it adds is just this simple little checklist on the upload screen. And it's like, set a great title, add great tags, um, go in and add cards, go in and add end card stuff, um, add your videos to some playlists. And these are all good things to do for growing your channel, but it's like, I would often forget to do things like that. Like maybe just one or two things. I'll, off, I'll often forget to like add a video to a playlist or I'll forget to do cards. Like I almost never forget the end cards, but I'll forget like in video cards. But having that there, I never forget now. It's sitting there. Yeah. And then when you, when you talked about like the whole process improvement thing, um, a kind of related thing, I had a checklist of all the B-roll that I wanted the editors to put into one of the videos but because I was at VidCon and they were coming to VidCon and they were gonna not have access to their computers, like we probably weren't gonna get it all done. So what I did is I went in and bolded all the ones that I thought were like prioritized because obviously if they're just going through it in order, they might not get the last one and it was a sponsored video. So like the last one needed to be there. Yeah, very Otherwise important. it's like a big fail thing. So by having the checklist by going and bolding it, they could prioritize very easily without having to be like, make a decision about, is this B-roll interesting? Do I need to ask him, et cetera. And I've prioritized stuff myself too. Yeah. A lot of times I'll like, I'll highlight things in my notebook when I'm editing myself. 
and be like, all right, this is important. This is just a dumb idea I had that would be cool if I had time, but I don't. And it's easier to actually think that when you can see it and make yeah. it better. Because when it's in your head, infinite possibilities are in your head. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So externalization, it's a good one. That brings us to the end, right? I think it does. That's all I got. Sweet. Cool. So that wraps up our first video podcast. Uh, I think this went pretty well, actually. Hope you liked our pretty faces. Yeah, his pretty face. But um, we're going to move this to live streaming Thank as soon as you. we can. So that's those are our lessons from the personal MBA. Uh, but I highly recommend reading this book. Obviously, like we just got like what an hour of content out of out of six, out of six parts. There are like a hundred billion there's, lessons. There's in a there. lot in here. There's a lot it's of stuff really to take useful. apart. Um, so I think you're going to get a lot of a lot of like good value. At minimum, out of it. literally just flip through it and see if it's worth your time. Yeah, exactly. And then consider getting it because it's got a lot in there. I just think you should get it because like it's it's not one of those books you have to commit to reading the whole thing. Yeah, you like could you're not going to skim feel this, and it guilty. still works. Exactly, you can just pick like, oh, I really want to learn how to work better with others. Read that chapter, yeah. or I'm interested in how sales works. Yeah, it's Bam. not it's not like a novel. You're not required to read part one before part yeah. ten. It's it's a reference book, but again, I think anybody who reads it is going to be more in tune with the incentives and what your bosses and managers want to do and what drives them. And now that I have it, actually, yeah. when problems come up, I'm very likely to just flip through it. Mm -hmm. Well, digitally, I have the Kindle version. And then and it'd be like, okay, does that actually talk about this? Are there any cool lessons in here? And it might because it has so many. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So guys, if you are not subscribed to the College Info Geek Podcast YouTube channel and you want to actually watch these, then definitely subscribe to the channel. And uh, the show notes with links to everything we talked about are going to be over at CIGpodcast.com slash 166. So check that out. Um, we've also got our favorite resources over at collegeinfogeek.com slash resources. That'll also be in the show notes. We've got apps that we recommend, to-do lists, all sorts of stuff that can remove friction from your lives help you to multiply your forces, all that good stuff. Yes. Um, we also have an essential books list over on that resources page, and this book is on it, along with many other great reads. So check that out if you're interested. And uh, if you happen to listen to this on the audio feed, or if you just want to help support the show, one of the ways you can do that is by giving us a rating and review on iTunes. If you have iTunes installed, it doesn't take very long, and that actually helps us bump up the charts in iTunes and uh, helps more people find this show. Yeah. So that is all we've got for this episode. The only thing I have to say before we close out here is once again, thank you guys, or thank you to FreshBooks for sponsoring this episode. And if you are a freelancer, if you work for yourself, definitely go give them a try over at freshbooks.com slash CIG. You can get that free unrestricted 30 day trial and start improving the way you run your business, multiplying your forces, removing friction from the invoicing process. Yep, that's all actually that good very, stuff. That's very applicable actually. It is very applicable. Yeah. You don't want stale books. We're good at segues Make here. them fresh. Yeah. Uh, and remember to put College Info Geek in that How Did You Hear About Us section when you sign up to let them know you came from our show. So thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next week. Stay cute.